Fibonacci numbers and nature. First of all, Fibonacci is actually a made-up name. The guy's name was never Fibonacci. It was apparently made up from Filius Bonacci, uh, which is simply Latin for Bonacci. Um, the guy's name was Leonardo Bonacci. He was born to Papa Bonacci and Mama Bonacci, and uh, sometimes known as Leonardo of Pizza. But he turns out to be a very important person uh, lived about um, 1175 to 1250 A.D. And his um, magnum opus was called Liber Abaci, Abaci, Abasi. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But uh, it's basically the abacus book. And in it, he introduced Arabic numerals to Europe. The fact that we use the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, instead of I, 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 V, 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 I. How many of you remember learning about those way back when? Yes. The reason we don't use them anymore is because of Leonardo Bonacci. Uh, he studied in uh, Algeria, in a city that's been variously spelled and probably variously pronounced. Um, and uh, the number series itself was already known in India. Um, it is not clear whether the Arabics knew it. Some of it could have been oral and not written. The numbers themselves actually come from I India as well. Um, the Arabics borrowed it from them, as far as I can tell. And um, so this is a guy that laid the foundation of what I think we would call modern mathematics in a certain way. Um, he described a puzzle, and the puzzle is very simple. You g given a pair of rabbits, and you assume that the original pair just keeps right on going, uh, which sexually mature in one month, so they can start having kids, and then they have a pregnancy every month with two kids apiece, which is a little small for rabbits, but we'll leave that alone. Um, and you have a pair of rabbits in two months, and a pair every month after that, and their offspring do the same thing. They take a month to sexually mature, then they take a month to have more rabbits, and the question is how many rabbits are left at the end of a year? Well. The first month, you have two rabbits that are sexually immature. The second month, you have two rabbits that are sexually mature. The third month, they now have babies. Well, those babies are sexually immature, so the next month, the original pair has baby, but those pair don't, don't have babies, and so forth. And you can figure this out, and it comes out to be an interesting number. First one. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and finally 144 at the end of a year. If you have 1,000 rabbits, you have 144,000 rabbits. But uh, <laughs> in any case, um, <clears throat> um, one of the interesting things is that if you add 1 and 1, you get 2. If you add 1 and 2, you get 3. If you add two and three, you get five, and each number is the sum of the numbers behind it. Uh, he went on to note that there were two more numbers, and of course this could go on forever, and he mentioned 233, and in a later edition of the book, he mentioned 377. Um, that's as far as he went for now. So one of the interesting things of that is, of course, as we mentioned, that uh, if you add the one number plus the number behind it, you get the number two numbers over, and conversely you can do subtraction, which means that the zeroth term is zero, interestingly enough. Now, the sum of all Fibonacci numbers up to Fn turns out to be Fn, uh, F to the, the n plus two minus one. That's easily mathematically provable, but let me just show you how that works. Let's take 
the numbers from 1 to 5. 1 plus 1 is 2, and then 2 plus 3 is 5, and 5 is 10, and those original 2 is 12. You will notice if you skip 2 beyond 5, you have 13, subtract 1, and you have 12. And it works every time. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's interesting is that if you take the number above and the number below a number and multiply them together, you get one different from the square of the number. So that, for example, if you have 8 times 8 is 64, 5 times 13 is 65. Now, if you do 13 times 13, you have 169, but if you have 8 times 21, it's 168. This time, one less. And in fact, it alternates from time to time. Now, it turns out that it's even weirder than that. If you take 2 on one side and 2 on the other side and multiply, you still get within 1, only it'll be the other side of it. Um, I know. Go ahead and try it. Uh, the ratio of f1 n plus 1 to fn approaches a, an interesting number called the golden ratio. Now, in fact, f of n divided by f of n plus 1 is the best approximation in a ratio of whole numbers of the golden ratio until you get to f of n plus 1 divided by n plus 2. So then, for example, 5 eighths is actually the closest you can get to the golden ratio with a bottom that's lower than 13. Once you get to 13, 8 thirteenths is the new king, and so forth. What is golden ratio? Well, we're going to come, we'll go over the golden ratio in just a minute, because the golden ratio is, um, if I may say so, beautiful. Um, to show you how quickly the series converges, we're going to start out with 1 over 1, which is 1, and then 2 over 1, which is 2, and then 3 over 2, which is 1.5, and 5 over 3, which is 1.666, and then uh, and, and 6666 on out, and then 1.6, 1.625, 1 1.615, and you can see we're getting very, very close to something uh, 1.618033987 and so forth. Um, the golden ratio is the most pleasing uh, ratio to the eye of length to width of a rectangle. Um, I mean, that's the golden ratio for what it's worth. Actually, it's a Fibonacci number approximating the golden ratio, but leave that alone. Um, if you cut off a square from a golden rectangle, the result is another golden rectangle going the other way. And in fact, you can keep on cutting off squares forever and continuing to get golden rectangles. So that here's a golden rectangle, you cut off a square, you get a golden rectangle here, which you cut off that square, you get a golden rectangle going here, cut off that square, get another golden rectangle going the uh, opposite way, cut off that, and now we have another golden rectangle, and you can imagine keeping on going smaller and smaller. Um, can we pass the microphone over to Wesley Keim? Given that he is an artist, I think that he should be allowed to speak at this point. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I think that it's worth pointing out that the golden, the golden ratio is, um, has been in use in art and at least until modernism came in, in which it's the inner eye rather than mathematics. And, uh, but it has been in use, but I've wondered just when it came in use. Uh, I was under the impression that even the Greeks used it. Well, the Greeks did use it. The Parthenon happens to be uh, fitting into a golden rectangle. Yeah. And also, it's interesting that those of you who use Photoshop and uh, go to the cropping tool, uh, the first thing that you see on the screen is it's how it's divided up into the golden ratio. And of course, you can, get, you can delete that if you want to, which I always do, and go by my site. 
But I just thought that before you get too far into science, it should be pointed out that the golden ratio is the, is, shall we say, the background, the very vertebral column of uh, classical art. I, I think that's fair to say. Um, the golden ratio comes up in another, uh, another thing. Supposing you have a pentagon with sides of one unit, okay? Um, the diagonal is phi units, that is, the golden ratio. In fact, if you remember that uh, I'm going to define C as 1 over phi, which means that it's also equal to phi minus 1, remember, um, you'll get uh, an even more interesting thing where you have C here, C here, and C squared here. C plus C squared equals 1, by the way. That is, this is the same length as that, as you can see from the fact that it's an isosceles triangle. It's fascinating that in, in pentagons, the golden ratio just pops up all over the place. Um, now, phi can actually be found by the following. Those of you who like math, enjoy. Those of you who don't, um, glaze your eyes over for a little bit. Um, uh, <laughs> phi equals 1 plus 1 over phi, because uh, that's exactly true. The Fibonacci series simply approximates that with numbers. And uh, phi squared, therefore, equals phi plus 1 if you multiply phi by everything in there. And then if you move everything over to the right, you'll see something. Uh, and that fits into the quadratic formula, but we're not going to go quite there. We're going to do it in a slightly different way. Uh, we're going to multiply it by 4, and this adds up to minus 4, just like that's minus 1. And uh, now the interesting thing is uh, if you move 5 off to the other side, you get uh, 4 phi squared minus 4 plus 1. And those of you who've done enough algebra will recognize that as the square of 2 phi minus 1 squared equals 5. And so you take the square root of either side, and um, this um, 2 phi minus 1 is equal to the plus or minus the square root of 5. And um, if you divide by 2, and, and uh, move the 1 to the other side, you get phi equals 1 over 2, plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. Now, minus the square root of 5 over 2 is going to be a negative number, so we're going to ignore that. And we're going to take the positive value, which is 1 half plus the square root of 5 over 2, which is equal to the ratio that we showed you before. Now, the Fibonacci series is interesting enough in and of itself. It has all kinds of self-referential oddities, you know, such as 1 plus phi equals phi squared. But the Fibonacci numbers appear all over nature, which is even more interesting, um, usually in terms of spirals. And uh, there's a handy website, but there are all kinds of websites. So if you go, you can probably see some of it in the Wikipedia that some of you guys looked up. Uh, here's a spiral. This is a pine cone, looking at it from the top. Uh, you can look at it from the bottom, it's the same view. Um, but here you will see spirals going both ways. And if you take the spirals going this way, you will look and you will count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 spirals, which happens to be a Fibonacci number. OK, well, what if you take the spirals going the other way? Well, then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight spirals, which is the Fibonacci number right next to 13, or one of the two. Interesting. Pineapples are typically this way. I, unfortunately, I forgot to bring a pineapple. I bought it and then forgot to bring it. 
Um, but there are five spirals if you count them going this way. There are eight spirals count if you count them going that way. And there are 13 spirals if you count them going the other way. Interesting. Now, this is a sort of cauliflower. And cauliflower itself has this plain old white cauliflower, you know, the kind you buy in the store, typically. But this one is interesting in that you will notice that you have spirals, and each one of these little spirals has its own little spiral system. And we're going to count spirals. Now, the, the easiest one to count is the ones that are, that are less tight. And so we're going to start with spirals um, there. And we're going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. Now, if you count them the other way, it's a little bit harder. I had to really work at this, but you can actually do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, it'd probably be easier if you look at it in the flesh, so to speak, but, uh, but there's a Fibonacci series one way and a Fibonacci series the other way, and it happens again and again and again. Here's one that just has five, so it doesn't really help you all that much, but uh, it is interesting. Now, this is the piece de resistance. Sunflower. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit so it's easier to see, and then we're going to look at it. Let's count the spirals going this way. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, right? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, yes? 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Can anybody guess? where you can find that number. That's right, it's a Fibonacci number. But even weirder, let's go the other way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. And you'll never guess where 55 sits, just on top of 34 in the Fibonacci series. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. As a matter of fact, I got interested in this and started counting pineapples and find pineapple after pineapple <laughs> after pineapple after pineapple was giving me nice and then I ran across one that had eight one way and 12 the other. I guess it's kind of like people with six fingers or something, you know? I mean, it happens just to prove that you don't have to do it that way. The pineapple seemed to be perfectly normal. There wasn't any obvious defect in it other than that the spirals didn't match. 
of interest uh, 8 and 12 is 4 times 2 and 3, so you've, you've got something there going. But um, there doesn't appear to be any survival value to it for the pineapple or even for our taste in the pineapple, but it's there. This, of course, has been used as an argument for creation by a mathematically inclined creator. Maybe. Um, here's some fun with an artichoke. What mathematical properties does an artichoke have? And I'm using this because I'm going to introduce to you the golden angle. Golden angle? Would that be like 72 degrees or something? I, well, actually, it's 360 degrees divided by phi squared. Now 360 degrees divided by phi is just the opposite of that golden angle because phi plus phi squared equals 1, which means that you do a complete revolution. But it's 137.5077 and it goes on from there, degrees. Um, uh, and uh, they, in this particular thing, they've abbreviated to 137.5. Um, but you'll notice that in the artichoke, there's one leaf here and there's another leaf over there. And that gives rise to a very interesting phenomenon. And that is if you take this artichoke and you put it in something that you can turn it, and you turn it 137.5 degrees and you take a picture and you turn it another 137.5 degrees and you take a picture. Or if you prefer, you can do it with a strobe light. Same, same thing. Uh, you suddenly get a very odd thing. Uh, I'm going to show you a video in just a minute. And what you're going to see at first is it turning just kind of in a, some other angle, which doesn't make too much difference. And you'll see it turning. And then when it gets to the 137.5, it will look like it stops turning, and instead you will see leaves either going out towards the end or coming back like they're blooming or something. Okay, watch carefully. Here we go. You're going to put the artichoke in, and they're going to turn it, and you can see it just looks like it's turning, and then it stops. And then you turn it the other way, and it will go backwards. See? You want to see that again? Uh, okay. Let's uh, let's do it again. Just just uh, let you get a good look at it. See turning randomly and then all of a sudden when you get at the right angle it tends to go out towards the end instead of instead of looking like it's turning pretty wild huh what it shows you is that that golden angle is very, very special for the artichoke. Now, <clears throat> there is recently an article, this is 2017, by Kuhlmeier in Current Biology. And uh, this is actually on the internet. I don't know that I could find it uh, in the, I'm sure it'll appear in the print version. Um, and it's online, so you can look at it. In fact, those of you who get the email got the um, online version early. Although, to be fair, this is not available itself online unless you want to pay some money for it. Uh, you, have to, you have to get it from someplace that has a library, which, by the way, is not Loma Linda this time. Uh, and uh, uh, or you can get it from interlibrary loan from Loma Linda, I think. But, uh, now the commentary is on, there's a commentary on uh, evolutionnews.org and that's where I first ran into this article, which is why I brought it to your attention. There's a summary at first, it's not titled an abstract, but it's, uh, it basically has the same idea. 
Leaves and flowers are arranged in regular patterns around the stem of a plant, a phenomenon known as phyllotaxis. Uh, different arrangements occur, such as uh, dice ditches, d decussate, or spiral. And I'm going to show you figure one in just a little bit so you have an idea of what they're talking about. Most prevalent in nature are spirals in which the average divergence angle between successive organs are close to 137.5 degrees, the so-called golden angle. And to show you how widespread this is, remember pine cones are um, they're conifers. Sunflowers are deciduous. We're talking about entirely different areas of, uh, of nature. It is this exact number that is given phyllotaxis. Well, not this exact number, of course. It's 50, uh, 137.5077, whatever. Um, uh, but, yeah, if you get close enough, it works. It is this exact number that is given phyllotaxis its special flavor as a quantitative developmental problem. And over the centuries, it has enjoyed the attention of scientists far beyond botany. Now you can see why. Um, so he's kind of promising or saying that he's looking at why this happens. In the 1830s, mathematicians described the spirals as they related to the Fibonacci numbers. And in the 1860s, so they've noticed this a long time ago, improved microscopes made it possible for botanists to observe the initiation of leaf and flower primordia in a diversity of plants. This descriptive work led to the conclusion that new organ primordia form in the first available space between existing primordia, a conclusion still valid today. But how does it work? Ideas from the early 20th century suggested that an inhibitor produced by existing primordia diffuses toward the shoot apical meristem, where the concentration of the inhibitor falls below a threshold value, an organ is initiated. Well, that was then. We don't believe that anymore. Other models dating back to the 1870s have tried to explain philotactic patterning, patterning by applying the laws of mechanics. Such models went through a long period of marginal interest, but have experienced a remarkable renaissance in the, over the past 20 years. In this primer, I will give a broad overview of philotaxis, its emergence from the shoot apical meristem, and how auxin and its transporter function as a pattern generator, and the role of tissue mechanics and computational modeling. So he's going to give you a lowdown of what we know. The anatomy of the shoot apex, the lateral organs have their organ origin in the shoot apical meristem, a simple dome-shaped structure at the very tip of the stem. This meristem is usually defined as a tissue above the youngest lateral organ primordium, a leaf or a flower. So defined, the meristem is about one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter, very small, like you really need a microscope, and consists of a few hundred cells that together weigh no more than two micrograms. This tiny organ generates all the stems, leaves, and flowers of the adult plant, and it keeps doing so over the lifespan of the plant for a few weeks in Arabidopsis, Arabidopsis, I'm sorry, for year after year in long-lived species and for century after century if you're a sequoia. I'm sorry, here is, um, this is corn. And you'll notice that it has one on one side and one on the other side, and one on one side and one on the other side, alternating. Here's one that splits and does two at the same time and then splits and does another two. Here's one that, that kind of rotates around, and you can see how it kind of makes it twist a little bit. And then here is one of those that produces the kinds of things that you've seen. First you have eight, and then you have seven, I know. Well, actually, there's probably nine and 10 and below that. But eight, and then seven, and then six grows, and then five grows, and then four grows, and then three grows, and then two grows. One grows, and you think maybe there's a little hint of something coming up there. The shoot apical meristem has been the object of intense study from when it was first viewed under a microscope in 1759. 
The internal cells tend to, I'm not reading the whole thing, of course, uh, that would take too long. The internal cells tend to divide with randomly oriented division planes, whereas the cells in the surface layer, the protoderm, divide perpendicular to the surface. So now, notice they divide randomly. Cell division is also non-synchronous. They're not all dividing at the same time or in sequence. Even neighboring cells can differ in cell cycle length by as much as a factor of four. And by the way, that is planned, as we'll find out. However, in spite of all of that crazy disorganization, despite this lack of cellular structure, geometry imposes order. A new unique position is occupied by the three or four cells at the very tip of the meristem. Analysis of clonal sectors and more recently direct and video and in vivo imaging demonstrate that these apical initials have a high probability of maintaining their position, whereas their descendants are displaced from the center and keep on growing. Together with early sequestration of axillary meristems, this allows trees to live for thousands of years without suffering mutational meltdown. Mutational meltdown, what is that? Some of you have been here before may re remember that we talked about that. It is the idea that as, as cells divide, there are mistakes made, and the more divisions there are, the more mistakes are made. And so you try to protect the cells that are going to give you the next generation, and the cells that are going to produce the next branch from that kind of mutational meltdown. But I thought that mutations were good for evolution. Apparently not. Genes and gene expression. The structure of the shoot apical meristem appears simple under the microscope, but within and between cells, intensely complex signaling is going on. This signaling provides subgroups of cells with distinct identities. They get different signals and then they behave differently. The list of signals includes small peptides in their receptors, transcription factors that move between cells, mobile small RNAs, and last but not least, most of the classical phytohormones such as auxin, cytokinin, gibberellin, and brassinosteroids. They're going to talk about auxin a lot, and so we're going to look at it in a minute. Approximately 20 cells at the tip of the meristem express a small peptide, CLV3, which moves to the cells below to repress the homeobox gene, Wuschel. A Wuss, in turn, in induces, the, uh, induces the expression of CLV13. So there's this negative feedback going on. The negative feedback between the two proteins stabilizes the sizes of the CLV3 and Wuss domains. Uh, they have a discussion about stem cells and they're saying, you know what, in plants almost all cells can be stem cells. The gardener who routinely regenerates stem cuttings in a glass of water smiles about the breakthroughs in mammalian stem cell research. Um, and then there's a big paragraph that talks about some experiments and, and it says from these experiments we conclude that the actively transported auxin is the instructive signal that determines both the induction and the positioning of lateral organs. You put auxin on something and it does interesting things. You put too much auxin on something and it destroys the plant. And that is, by the way, why 2,4-D is used as a defoliant because it is, in fact, a synthetic auxin. Patterning is not thought, uh, not through an inhibitor emanating from the young leaves. Remember, we heard that theory before. Um, but the opposite, through redistribution of an activator, auxin, that is present in the meristem itself. And uh, auxin, there are actually uh, five identified auxins at least. Uh, the most important one is on the upper left. But you can see the plant, I, I don't know how they do this, but they manage to attach a chlorine to the, the indole ring sometimes. And you can have one that looks like that only with a chlorine. 
and you can have um, a longer propionic acid instead of acetic acid stack, and you can have a butyric acid stack, and you can have, uh, interestingly, a phenylalanine uh, with the nitrogen replaced by an oxygen and the carboxylic acid taken off, which is what happens, by the way, apparently for uh, tryptophan, which is one of the amino acids, the biggest, most complicated one. And uh, if you take the nitrogen and replace it with a carbonyl group, and then you take the carbon dioxide off and oxidize this, you get the primary oxen that plants use. The combined experimental results suggest models in which an autoregulatory loop between oxen and subcellular PIN localization creates oxen maxima. Uh, PIN is an oxen transport protein that allows the oxen to be transported away from the tip to down below. The oxen PI will in one interaction can be envisaged to function as a pattern generally, generator conceptually similar to the circadian clock, which goes back and forth and back and forth in a rhythmic manner. Like the circadian oscillator, it generates outputs, responds to inputs, and is sub subject to feedback regulation. A beautiful example of feedback is how a cytokine-related protein stabilizes divergence angles. As mentioned above, individual angles can vary substantially. Occasionally, organs may also arise at normal positions, but in the wrong temporal order, that is, the n plus one primordium develops ahead of the nth instead of the nth first and the n plus one. So there's a lot of variation that could take place and somehow that's smoothed out. Philotaxis is a 3D patterning problem. I'm gonna just skip that whole uh, paragraph. The role of mechanics in a purely biophysical model, the position of the bulges is determined by the mechanical properties of the meristem. But we know, uh, we now know that bulge formation is a response to a biochemical si uh, signal, uh, PIN mediated local oxen accumulation. Oxen promotes the local expression of cell wall loosening proteins that locally reduce the stiffness of the cell wall and allow turgor pressure to induce a bulge. Quantitative models, well, how do you get that precise angle? Philotaxis is an inherently quantitative problem, but how can a small molecule in concert with its transporter induce organ formation at angles of 137 degrees? That's the question. 137.5, of course, but who's fighting over half a degree? Early computational models uh, posited an inhibitor that is produced by pre-existing primordia and diffuses into the meristem. When the inhibitor decays with time and distance, patterns are produced. Such pre-oxin models are simple and robust, and by varying parameters, they can reproduce all major philotactic patterns. So, we got a nice theory, and it works well. There's only one problem. It isn't true. Um, Integrating the recent pharmacological and genetic data makes models biologically more plausible. They fit with what we know, but unfortunately also more complex and less robust. That is to say, little tiny perturbations suddenly make things go haywire. Even, this is even more of a challenge when models are implemented on geometric, geometrically realistic templates with cells that grow and divide as in a real life meristem. So when they try to do a computer model of how this thing works, it doesn't work so well. A problem that haunts the field is the lack of quantitative molecular data. We don't know exactly where the oxen is, how much of it there is, and it makes it difficult to figure out what our model should show. It remains impossible to measure oxen concentrations with cellular resolution in an in individual cell, and the quantitative data on polar oxen transport are based on experiments from the 1970s performed on mature tissues, which may not apply to this little bitty meristem. Presently, we, mean, we need more experimental data rather than more computational models. Um, yeah? Function of philotaxis, it is not altogether clear 
This is an understatement. It is not altogether clear what the adaptive function of the different philotactic patterns is. In an annual plant such as Ara 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 Arabidopsis or tomato, individual ankles can fluctuate substantially with no apparent negative consequences. Doesn't really matter. For sure, if all leaves were preferentially on one side, the stem would, be, would bend under the unequal distribution of the weight of the lateral organs. Spiral patterns are thought to maximize light capture, but mathematical modeling suggests this to be significant only under special conditions. So there just isn't enough push to get there. See, so remember, what evolution has to explain is not just the survival, but the survival in 99 plus percent Fibonacci series related spirals. Why? The most precise philotactic patterns are found in situations where light is unlikely to be a factor. For instance, spiral sy systems in the sunflower head, which have divergence angles with accuracies in the order of 1%. Remember to get that 55 to 34? That means you really, really have to be accurate. Anyway, plants ev have evolved sophisticated shade avoidance mechanisms to rapidly adjust to variable light con conditions. So why do they need this kind of pattern? Other explanations propose tight packaging of emerging young organs, possibly to limit ingress of pathogens. Possibly. Perhaps the un rather unsatisfactory default explanation is the regular patterning is simply an emergent property of the molecular mechanism of lateral organ initiation. Let me translate that. This is very similar to idiopathic disease in humans. Literally self-generated. What it really means is we haven't the foggiest notion. Let's just be honest. It happens. It emerges. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Aaron giving the account to Moses. Well, I told everybody to throw their jewelry into the fire. And out came this calf. It emerged. It is a rather unsatisfactory explanation. Now, the summary. Experimental evidence and computational modeling strongly suggest that philotactic patterning works through a positive feedback loop between oxen and its transporter. The competing theories that have been proposed for the underlying molecular mechanism emphasize the central fact that we don't really know how the patterning is driven. That is to say, we don't really have any good idea. There are further unsolved issues. So we're do not just this. How does convergence point formation in the surface layer interact with the formation of the mid vein in a leaf, for example? And how can we explain that uh, the Aridopsis pin one mutant makes leaves at all when it doesn't have pin to transport the oxen? and in non-random positions, no less. So uh, something is missing here. Could this be a manifestation of a rudimentary biophysics-based patterning mechanism? Maybe. The interactions between endogenous signaling and environmental influences offer an exciting new research angle. Our lack of understanding of the selective advantage of the various philotactic patterns may reflect the focus of our molecular genetic research on vegetable, uh, vegetative and inflorescent meristems in just a flu few flowering plants. Maybe we haven't looked at enough of them. The spiral arrangements of the leaf-like organs in bryophyte gametophytes result from oriented cell divisions of the apical initials. So you can do it without having to have any of, uh, uh, but, but 
remember the meristems that we're talking about don't have oriented, at least as far as we know, cell divisions of the apical initials. Is this an ancestral auxin mediated mechanism or did it evolve independently? Or I don't know, was it designed by somebody who liked mathematics? Could me mechanics have perhaps been a crude ancestral mechanism that predated auxin dependent patterning? Mm -hmm. then why invent another one for no apparent benefit? What about philotactic patterns in flowers? Philotaxis reaches its greatest diversity in the flower where it is obviously related to different reproductive strategies. How do regulatory mechanisms of philotaxis interact with extremely well-studied floral organ identity determinants? It is not that we have run out of basic questions to be asked in model plants. Instead, there is a world of diversity waiting to be explored. Well, my take on all this, the Fibonacci series is mathematically intriguing. It is somehow, we don't know exactly how, but somehow it's related to beauty. It is found in nature without question, and current <coughs> explanations of why it is found in nature are not convincing. There, most importantly, there does not appear to be any survival value to using the Fibonacci series. It is a special case of features of nature that are for the benefit of some one, something or someone else solely. Now, if you find something like that, it looks like design. In fact, I'm going to go further than that. It looks like it is not evolution. Darwin said, and all the way back to 19, 1859, if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection. Yeah. And if you have something that is solely for beauty, for humans, and maybe God, then there's no reason for a doggy dog world to have produced that kind of structure. Is this an adequate reason to disbelieve neo-Darwinian evolution? Well, it depends on how strong your reasons to believe it are, but I think it helps. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. I told my wife, oh, I've always wondered about this. Not. <laughs> the people that do this research, I'm guessing most of them are atheists. Yeah. In a way, explain what they wanted to find. Well, I think that they wanted to find that this particular setup is the most mechanically easy, the most, it, it just kind of falls out of biochemistry. It's just natural. They follow it step by step, but yeah. they get to areas where all of a sudden biochemistry doesn't do what it, they thought it doesn't, should do. It doesn't do what, it, is, what it's expected. You see, because it, either it has to have survival value in, its, uh, in and of itself, or it has to have value as what uh, Stephen Jay Gould would call a spandrel. Now, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, uh, in cathedrals um, there would be arches and there would be arches that came around and then there would be this little area here that kind of naturally wanted to be filled in after a while, people stop 
leaving them blank and started putting pictures on them and started putting all kinds of stuff in them. They weren't really intended. Hmm. See, what is trying to be said is that life wasn't really intended. These patterns weren't really intended. It's just that if you're kind of trying to collect, uh, construct something like a cauliflower, you have to have the new ones coming up, and they come up in a pattern that, that somehow naturally produces the Fibonacci series. That's the idea. Doesn't have to. So My pineapple that had eight rows in one and 12 rows the other way looked like a perfectly good pineapple. I don't know of any particular reason to believe that it wouldn't have worked. So we say th some things in nature are simply there because God loves beauty. I, I'm not sure you can make an ironclad case for that, but I think you can make a somewhat persuasive case for that. And order. And order. And order, yes. Beauty, beauty and, and order. order. It is not just chaos. Coming back here. Can you explain what the difference is between the Fibonacci numbers and the Mandelbrot set of, for fractals? Well, um, Mandelbrot set is if I understand the concept correctly, simply something that can be repeated on a smaller scale and a smaller scale and a smaller scale. Uh, uh, the, the broccoli that you saw, um, it's a Romanesque broccoli or whatever it is, that had those patterns of spirals, that had little things that had their own spirals, that had little things that had their own spirals, that's kind of a, a Mandelbrot set. But the fact that the spirals were arranged in rows of eight one way and 13 the other way, that is the Fibonacci series. Mandelbrot does not necessarily have to be done in Fibonacci style stuff. But they both bring order out of chaos. They both bring order out of chaos. Uh, Mandelbrot brings a special kind of order that is um, each part is kind of to the, to the whole like the next part is to it. Um, uh, but, uh, but the Fibonacci series is to say that there are, there are certain rows and they come in a certain way and uh, I, you know I I think that if you can get started on the Fibonacci series, once you get started, if you just keep bringing rows out, you'll find out that uh, uh, that the that the uh, rows tend to naturally reproduce themselves. And I'm going to give you an illustration. If you look here, you will notice the spirals that we talked about, and the other spirals come in the other way. But if you look in a little closer, you'll find some more tightly wound spirals. And those ones go around and they show a ratio of 21. Uh, there are 21 spirals going around. Yeah, you can count them. It works. You're looking at it going, can't be. It is. Yes, come in over here. It's not just in natural, in botany or other things that you have this occurring. You also, in some human-related areas, you have Fibonacci numbers occurring. Um, Dr. Robert, uh, oh, I can't think of Robert McHugh runs a website called technicalindicatorsindex.com. And he's a technical analyst for analyzing the stock market. And he has what are called female turn dates, in which he takes, a, he takes what he considers an important 
date in the stock market, such as March 14, 2000, which was a major top. And then he counts the number of trading days to, a, say, a local low or a local high. And these often turn out to be FEMATE, what he calls FEMATE turn dates, which are numbers which are related to the Fibonacci sequence. And these things show up, and he uses, he's been using them to predict turning points in well, the, the stock market. The question is, can you make money off of it? <laughs> he, he has made quite a bit of money off it, actually. And so it's, so it's not just, it, you're not just seeing them in, in, uh, in the botanical or the animal world, you're seeing them in the uh, human world as well. Fascinating. This is the kind of topic that invites mathematically infinite implications. And um, among the many that occur to me is the matter of numerology in the Bible. There are those who try to take the Bible and mathematically dissect it as an, uh, with an to discern an underlying, well, the overall term is numerology, and I'm afraid I can't carry it any farther than that because I have been rather contemptuous of it at, at the worst and certainly disinterested in the least. Um, I think by the same token, in as much as I can speak more authoritatively from an artistic standpoint than from the mathematical where I'm really rather a stranger. So many of you in this room obviously are so much better at mathematics. But um, when it, it, it has often occurred to me that the kind of artistic eye that I have is absurd because it takes in the grand view. I look at perspective and, and composition. And by the same token, I'll miss a bird in the branch. I'd make a terrible bird watcher. Now, on one extreme, we have numerology and we have mathematics carried down to almost to the quantum level. And on the other extreme, you have such as I, who don't even see any of that, but see the overall pattern and see a composition. How does mathematics determine composition? It is exactly the opposite extreme. Well, I fear I've carried this soliloquy long enough, and I'd sure be interested to hear what more mathematically inclined people one might have to say about numerology in the Bible. Well, I think, it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's pretty obvious what's going on here with this picture of the sunflower. You know, imagine if you're a bee approaching the flower, as you're coming towards that spiral pattern, it's going to make you really dizzy, and you're going you're to hone right into the center. You're going to land, and you're going to be stumbling around for quite some time, getting pollen on your legs, and you fly off, and, and, and <laughs> so it has survival advantage. <laughs> You and Rudyard Kipling would have been friends. <laughs> but, but bees Just a minute. Let's, uh, let's catch this on, on tape here. Yes. I thought the bees' eyes were very complex as well. Well, see, that makes, that's to compensate for yeah, all that. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, like I say, it's really hard to connect this with survival value. And it looks like people are trying to connect it with some kind of mechanical requirement and really not coming up with anything at this point. Now, could it happen later? Yeah. But, you know, I'm reminded that somehow if you're an atheist, you're allowed to say, but we don't know how life happened, but it evolved this way, because we're secure on that. Whereas if you're a, a creationist, 
appeals to, um, you know, God of the gaps is just not allowed. So, um, I think that while we're looking at stuff, I think we have to put together our best present picture, realizing that it could be wrong, but our best picture sort of suggests that whoever did this kind of liked mathematics. Well, on a, on a serious note, um, I, I do wonder, I mean, one thing that the Fibonacci series does is it uses, if I'm correct, it uses the previous number to inform the current number to make the next number. Correct. So there is a type of proportionality there. Yeah. Um, so anything that's growing and then if the more that it grows, the more it's able to grow, I wonder if it would be a, a similar sort of thing. Uh, it'd be interesting to explore that. Um, obviously, the article writer would uh, dearly love to hear your ideas, because he hasn't got any, or right. at least not any that that fit what we know. Uh, yeah, Ariel, and then. Uh, I'd This, this is, of course, speculation like uh, what we're doing here today. Uh, but, um, you know, in, uh, I think it was about 20 years ago, they were able to get fruit flies to produce eyes on their legs uh, using the oxygen and so on. And uh, very interesting experiments. Uh, and these eyes uh, did not have the same geometric pattern as uh, some, of the, some of the cells are much longer than others they didn't have a <laughs> and uh, it, nevertheless uh, those cells were functional they could get uh, an impulse out of them by exposing light to them uh, uh, at the, the nerves coming at the base of the cell type of thing. Do they have nerves running to the brain or something to uh, uh, Friday, Friday I'm not Houston? sure they had a connection to the brain, but they were functional. And, uh, sort of. Which, uh, yeah, that, that part, which it tells me, you know, uh, it challenges a little bit survival of the fittest for the Fibronacci series because at least parts of eyes work without that pattern. Okay, and uh, Mrs. Smith. Um, as we began this summary, I happened to remember shells that I have in a collection and broken shells that show the spirals. And I came across this. Um, the spiral has become a powerful symbol for creation and growth used by many ancient cultures and religious traditions. And the moon goddess, which is connected with the spiral formation inside of a nautilus, you could cut a nautilus, uh -huh. um, has, and it, it just reminds me that man has always tried to make sense of patterns in their religious ceremonies and many of the Native Americans tried to make sense and, and actually you know according to this article it's just a short paragraph um, it was part of their religious worship um, we try well if, if you it's think gone. of that man trying to make sense of patterns mm -hmm or starting as babies is exactly what science is all about. Mm -hmm. I don't know <clears throat> the exact dimensions of the sanctuary, but when you put your rectangle up there and then cut a square off, it looked like yeah. a sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that thing pops up all over. Uh, you have come in here. Cannot help it, but uh, looking at this reminds me of a nebulous. 
and uh, and uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, but there are so many. I mean, there are millions of them that spiral uh -huh. clockwise uh -huh. and millions counterclockwise. Yeah. And we read a beautiful text in Job. Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or lose the belt of Orion? Pleiades is spreading out. Orion, the belt yeah. is together. You know, I mean, he has he's put in things for people's minds to be puzzled. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I suppose spiral galaxies that have the right spiral live longer or something? Uh. <laughs> Yes. There seem to be spirals in galaxies. Have we computed them mathematically to see if they're true or false? Well, uh, they kind of look sort of like logarithmic spirals, but uh, uh, it would be interesting to ask that question. Um, Does dark matter mess up? That? Well, actually, dark matter is used to explain them. And I'll tell you why. Galaxies are supposed to be billions of years old, which means that they've undergone several rotations. And by the time you do that, you mess up those beautiful arms because the inner part goes faster than the outer part. And pretty soon all you have this, this kind of muddy swirl. Um, so uh, all galaxies should look elliptical if they're as old as they're supposed to be. And dark matter, one of the functions of dark matter is to keep the outer arms spinning faster so that the inner arms don't completely lose them in their, uh, in their turning around so that the galaxies look younger than they really are. Hmm. Kind of an interesting phenomenon to have to explain. Uh, on top of that, dark matter is not only there, but it, there's more dark matter than there's regular matter. Dark matter obviously interacts with regular matter. Is dark matter structured? How would we know without seeing it? Well, it must not be structured because otherwise that would imply um, some kind of order, ordering pattern, um, maybe an intelligence. Yes. Got a picture of a, uh, let's see, if we can turn this, let's see, I think flip it to this and yeah. see, see if that will give you the, yes. Was that a galaxy? Or that a was a galaxy, yeah, or a, at least a <laughs> photograph of a galaxy. Uh, downloaded to one final thought from me this I'm a baby at all this stuff there was I listened to a lady a couple weeks ago who uh, kept saying that the mechanism for evolution are already in place and that's why she's a theistic evolutionist it seems to me that more overpowering than that statement is the reality in nature that God has inserted beauty and order and not just for himself, for himself, but for all of us, for the creatures he created. That we can detect. So, yeah. So this, I don't understand this, uh, mechanisms for evolution are already in place, so therefore it's got to be true. Well, well, she had several different, you know, like the four foot by something that you planted one. What was it, Lauren? I was going to answer you. 
and you planted one over here and they watched it grow exponentially till it hit the other side mechanism for evolution I guess she was trying to say thank you just a comment about this mechanism for evolution if there is one factor that is rather firm it is, is that they don't have a mechanism for the evolution of complexity uh, this has been well established uh, they tr they've tried Lamarckism for, for a long time then they tried survival of the fittest for a while then they tried the modern synthesis for a while now there's a diversity of views out there there is no known mechanism for explaining complexity. As a matter of fact, you can put limits to the complexity that, that, that uh, can be expected without having some kind of guidance. And uh, the, the thing to remember there, I think, and it's very important, is that, is that Natural selection cannot create anything. All it can do is select from things that are already created. And so all the work from an unguided position has to, be, has to come from random mutations or else if a directed mutation, so to speak. If it's directed mutations, you're not talking about evolution anymore, not of the classical kind. There's a God there who's doing stuff. And then uh, the entire project was to get God out of the picture. Once God's in the picture, then the rules change dramatically. Yeah. Keep, keep in mind that uh, the mantra is survival of the fittest and a lot of people think that explains everything immediately when you put that into trying to develop a complex structure it falls apart because in complex structures you have to have several parts until the for it to work and unless all those parts are there it will not work like your eye for instance and in fact survival of the fittest should destroy those useless parts that are uh, extra uh, an encumbrance to the organism so the, the actual mantra of survival of the fittest uh, actually inhibits the development of complex part at least we, we, it should uh, theoretically you can say at least it should do that uh, so uh, uh, you need to look in the details of this one. You need to be clearly distinguish between the simple survival of the fittest type of thing and the process of developing complex things. That's where evolution falls apart when you get to the complex. Let me put this down. And what you want to say? New, uh, let's see. Go ahead. Yeah, just put it up. We're going to try something a little different now. Um, we have found somebody overlaying a Fibonacci spiral over that galaxy. It will be fascinating to see. But, you know, galaxies grow by uh, special processes that just produce these naturally or maybe the best galaxies survive and the other ones go away or something I, God has put beauty all around us everywhere he has done this this is a signature um, it is a signature in some ways more secure than simply survival value because survival value might come from someplace else but did you manage to get it I'm trying to turn this 
uh, to the bottom one on that here. Um, there. There you go. <laughs> Pretty amazing. That's Fibonacci spiral. Yeah. What about the center moving faster? <laughs> <laughs> yes. In the bay off uh, Thailand, we saw lungfish making their way across the surface of the mud. Obvious to us, they were learning to walk. Now, I don't know how long they've been learning to walk, but we better be careful and not we don't see a dozen of them lined up in a river dance or something. Uh, now, if God created things specifically for our enjoyment. That is something that evolution cannot explain. <clears throat> the only real way around that is to say that beauty is just a byproduct, or to say that our sense of beauty comes from seeing nature and so therefore we somehow fit to how nature fits. If you ever see a peacock feather up close and you see the eyes going right through all of the design that is required for making feathers, you realize that there is way more detail than needs to be there. As a matter of fact, we know now from experiments that the peahens don't really care. Which means that that display is really for us. Darwin is quoted at one point as saying that, that the sight of a peacock made him sick. <laughs> I can see why. Because if you're trying to create something where dog eat dog creates increasing complexity, you can manage maybe, if you've got a lot of imagination and not a lot of constraints about how fast things can pop into being. Uh, but what you really have trouble with is this idea that it was made for us. Because whenever nature looks like it's made for us, it can't be. Because if it were, there's nothing to drive it to do that other than a designer, if you like a benevolent designer. That means that every time you see beauty in nature, of a kind that didn't have to be, it's evidence of a God who loves us. And we may find out someday that actually the Fibonacci numbers are somehow required. Maybe they are. The requirement itself make, is interesting. But at this point, it doesn't look like we have any explanation. Like it, the trunk of an elephant. Why should an elephant start lengthening its nose until he had the appropriate... Uh, His legs got longer. <laughs> <laughs> there, are all, there are all kinds of stories out there about that. <laughs> and then the next question is, well, then why didn't the rhinoceros grow a trunk? See, at a certain point, you're back to just those stories. The giraffe got its neck because it needed to reach higher and higher in the trees. Then why didn't all the female giraffes starve? Because they're shorter. Uh, at a certain point, it does not make sense. 
Uh, one more comment here. Did you learn about this when you were in grade school? Just did, did you I, learn about this in no, grade school? No, I did not learn about it in grade How, school. What about in high school? Um, I think I was in college when I learned about it. So I'm very unhappy today that I'm, that I'm just learning about this. And I've been teaching for 42 years, so. And you could have been teaching this. And the kids would have been, wow. Well, we studied about the, the pine cone. We took a look at it, but I didn't know it had a name. I mean, we looked at sunflowers, but I didn't know it had a name. You mean to count the, oh, the, yeah, the spirals? Oh, yeah, to do all the spirals and look what God did, and you know, but I didn't know it had but a name. Did, did you, did you so know? I guess I should be happy about that. Yes. Did you know that the counting of those spirals always ran into a very special set of numbers? No. No. No, because I taught, fourth, I taught fourth grade, so, One of the <laughs> best kept secrets in, uh, in the world, actually. I, I would like to know in this class, how many of you learned about this in school? One. Okay. Two. Two. How far, how far up? Uh, grade school? Second year college. So college, I, I am, both I of am, us. I am, I am, I'm distraught over this, really. Well, look at, it, look at it this way. <laughs> this video you can share with your fourth grade teachers, your yes. friends, your younger friends who, who then will know. No, and I really think it is really important for this kind of stuff to get out. Yeah. It's not popular in the standard literature for obvious reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't notice it and teach it and have the kids fascinated because they can go out and pick up their own pine cones and mm -hmm. count the rows. Okay. Those the I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, what's, what's interesting, uh, you have to get a peacock feather to actually see it, but the rib that goes through this is colored the same color as everything else. Um, and then, and it has the eye that there are feather things that are going this way. Oh. Wait. Yes. You think that's another um, I have I haven't counted it, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. There's some there's some really nice eyes. But here, take you can see the structure of the feather itself. You see, and this is colored the same black here as the rest of this black, which is not uh, the feather structure you can see is going that way. So that the pattern cuts across the feather. It's not just all the same color on the same veins that are, that, that are coming out, the, you know, the the, uh, I've forgotten the names of them, the, the you know, feather structures. Uh, uh, well, see, th th this is the main vein, I think, or what it, and then, and then there are the, then there's structures that come out and then there are little barbules and hooks that keep them together. But you can see that the, that the pattern is just cutting across it. And the female hen doesn't care. So why does a peacock have that kind of intimate, really well-designed eye on it? We don't. Pardon? <laughs> the switches were turned off and the female Degeneration. Degenerated. Anyway, so come on back next week and we're going to prove that the universe isn't real.